Greetings and welcome to the latest event in the Geese College of Business Global Challenges in Business webinar series. I'm Amanda Brantner, Senior Associate Director of Learner Relations here at the University of Illinois Geese College of Business. And I look forward to spending the next hour with you. Our faculty experts at Geese have developed this series of webinars to address the business risk of coronavirus and enable you to be better prepared for all the challenges it presents. We hope that today you'll gain some knowledge and strategies to not only weather this storm, but succeed through it. Before we get started with cyber threats in the age of COVID-19 with Robert Brunner and David Nickel, I want to cover a few housekeeping items related to the Q&A portion of today's session. Please submit all of your questions via the Zoom Q&A feature. Your questions will be submitted publicly for the whole audience to see. In order to develop consensus around questions, please use upvoting. The upvote thumb is located next to the question in the Q&A window. You can only upvote a question once, but you can reverse your vote. The top questions will be brought to Robert and David during the webinar. Any general housekeeping questions will be answered in text by the GEESE team working in the background. Questions submitted via chat will not be taken. At this time, I am pleased to introduce today's speakers. Robert Brunner is Associate Dean and Chief Disruption Officer at Geese College of Business. He joined, joined the college in 2017 and also serves as a Professor of Accounting and Director of the University of Illinois Deloitte Foundation Center for Business Analytics. Robert previously worked in the University of Illinois Department of Astronomy, Beckman Institute, Department of Statistics, and Informatics Institute, among others. He holds a bachelor's and a master's in physics from Purdue University, and a master's and PhD in astronomy from Johns Hopkins University. David Nickel is the Franklin W. Woltledge Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois, where he serves as the director of the Information Trust Institute. David researches means of improving cybersecurity in critical infrastructures like the electric power grid and founded Network Perception, a startup that licenses software used to analyze the cybersecurity of complex computer networks. Prior to joining Illinois in 2003, David served on the faculty of Dartmouth College and the College of William and Mary. Please join me in welcoming Robert Brunner and David Nickel. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. We have a very large audience. It's great to see. Uh, I think the first question I wanted to ask David uh, relates to his background and his expertise, and that is uh, David is the director of the Information Trust Institute. So I think it'd be helpful for everybody in the audience to understand a little bit better about the nature of the Information Trust Institute and, and what the mission of the Institute is. Sure. Thanks, Robert, and, and thanks to the, the Geese School for um, setting this up. Uh, it's, it's the result of a conversation that I had with Robert some months ago. He was swinging by to talk and see what was happening about information trust, and we had a, a jolly good time uh, chatting in the, in the office. And um, one thing led to another, and, and here we are. So I hope that we can recreate the, uh, the fun that we had in the office that day. So the Information Trust Institute um, is uh, an organization that's uh, housed in the um, um, Ranger College of Engineering. It uh, was launched in 2003 as a result of uh, grassroots efforts by faculty uh, across the engineering college uh, to write a NSF proposal, a large engineering research center proposal that was looking at cybersecurity in, in network systems. And as a, as a result of the realization that there was a corpus of faculty uh, with these common interests, um, the, the administration had the uh, amazingly good wisdom to go pick the pocket of the state of Illinois to get some seed money to uh, start um, ITI and, and, and try and get uh, uh, this focal point uh, built up, recognized and uh, engaged uh, with, uh, with the community uh, interested in things related to, to security. So our first big win uh, was in 2004 uh, when we won the largest to date at the time 
uh, award from the National Science Foundation to establish a center looking at cybersecurity uh, in the electric power grid. And that really charted the course for much of what uh, uh, ITI became. So where ITI is now, a whole bunch of years later, is that we are uh, a home uh, center for a number of uh, large centers. Uh, we continue to do uh, collaborative work with other universities and national labs uh, in the area of cyber resilience for uh, energy systems, including electric power. We've got a large center uh, that we uh, operate for the Department of Homeland Security, looking at uh, critical infrastructure resilience, um, doing large things with, with DARPA on how to protect, how to bring back the electric power grid if most of it is brought down by uh, a cyber attack. So uh, as you can see, we're doing a lot of work in the space of uh, industrial control systems, particularly uh, critical infrastructures. The work that we do uh, has particular emphasis on uh, research that's needed, that's informed by problems that industry um, recognizes in the trajectory uh, that, that they're going on. There are some 90 plus faculty members um, of ITI, and one of our jobs is to assist them um, in identifying and developing um, uh, proposals uh, for uh, these large centers, and then as they are one to, to, manage, uh, to manage them and support the management of them. Well, well, thank you. That clearly is a, a wide swath, a wide swath of uh, things that ITI is 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 investigating, um, and I'm sure you you could dive deep into uh, uh, some of these topics. But I think for our audience, the, the the most important thing at this at this point is, is is can you talk at a high level about the different cybersecurity threats facing business and society, um, keeping in mind the nature of our, our audience uh, distributed around the world, uh, primarily coming from that business background? Sure, well, I'll, well, I'll try. Um, I'll, I'll ask you to do a mind experiment or ask, ask yourself a question. So um, why do we have locks on houses, on cars? Why do we have bank vaults? Uh, why do we have shades on windows? Why do we have non-confidentiality agreements? Uh, all of these are things that we use to protect ourselves against loss. Against loss of money and property, life, against loss of intellectual property, against loss of reputation perhaps, lost against in business context, the, the ability to compete. So cyber threats are threats um, against these kinds of things um, where the, the particular vehicle for the threat comes uh, using computers and, and data. So there are some specific kinds of threats um, that, that are out there. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's quite a collection of them, um, but, but it gives you a sense of, of the breadth of it. So one thing that you hear about um, rather too often um, are data breaches. So in the not too distant past, there was a data breach of the Equifax uh, credit monitoring service. And what was liberated in that attack were applications of people that were in the process of um, applying for loans. And so um, a great deal of their um, specificity about their identity and their financial information uh, was there. And as I'll touch on later, I think um, this kind of information can be used by attackers to um, steal their identity and, and uh, <laughs> saddle them with loans that they have to pay, but the, but the attackers have managed, managed to take out. Um, there's a, a, another interesting uh, vehicle uh, example would be a, a data breach attack that happened on the chain of Target um, department stores. And what happened there was that uh, attackers were able to get software in the point of sale machines where you're at the, you know, at the counter and handing over a credit card. And uh, as the credit card's being scanned, then that information was grabbed and eventually bundled up and, and sent off uh, someplace else. Now, the interesting thing about that particular attack is how it was that that uh, software that shouldn't have been there uh, got to the, to the point of sale. And there was this complicated chain, which is typical of, of cyber attacks. The, the chain started with a contractor. Uh, the uh, refrigeration contractor for uh, for Target, and um, the the attackers manage to get what are called key loggers installed on machines there, and the key loggers were just watching 
until somebody logged into the to the target site to do whatever it was that the contractor did. And then the uh, the attackers were able to steal those, take those credentials and log themselves into the target site. And they hadn't, they didn't know what the target computer system looked like in any sort of detail. And so they then did what was called reconnaissance. And so they, I had software that was looking around to find out where there were interesting things, they know what to look for. Uh, they would compromise a device, take it over from there, they would have more information about the target system, find something else to compromise and so on, until finally they got to the point of sale and they were able to steal all of those, all of those things. So consequences of things like these data breaches um, can be bad. Uh, you can have civil lawsuits, um, the impact that the data loss has on people whose data has been exposed. You can have uh, sometimes criminal lawsuits if the data has been exposed, if the, if the entity that um, had their data breached wasn't taking uh, sufficient care with protection, then there are certain uh, privacy laws that might be violated and they'd be uh, subject to prosecution for that. Um, ought to be of some interest to uh, people in business that as a result of data breaches, sometimes executives need to find new lines of employment because somebody's got to take the rap. Uh, there's loss of consumer, consumer confidence, reputation, and, and market share. Other kinds of threats uh, would be um, the exfiltration by an attacker of intellectual property. You climb in the Wayback Machine and go back to the beginning of the millennia. There, uh, is a company that used to exist called Nortel in Canada. They were a networking company, a very large networking company in Canada. And, and as it happened, some attackers got inside of their networks and were there for a very long time, years they were inside. And they, uh, they managed to steal all of the designs of the networking equipment that um, was uh, in, in, <laughs> in their design vaults. Uh, and those designs went to another country that shall remain unnamed. Uh, and uh, a brand new company uh, was formed in said, in said country, uh, which uh, developed uh, communications gear that looked remarkably like Nortel's um, at lesser cost. And Nortel eventually uh, went out of business. So loss of intellectual property can be uh, a big deal. Uh, identity theft, I'd mentioned that, and that's when um, attackers are able to get enough information about a person or a business so they can represent themselves, misrepresent themselves uh, to some agency that basically is usually handing out money and get that agency to hand the attackers some money and um, have it look like it's all on the up and up, but it's not on the up and up. And uh, the people whose identity has been stolen are the ones who are then expected to pay. And it can be very difficult. I have not had this happen to me, but I'm told um, by those that have, it can be very difficult to extract oneself from, from uh, such a situation. Uh, another kind of attack is um, to have one's um, association um, that one's made over the internet um, uh, leaked. And so you can imagine uh, association, be membership in some uh, political party that's not public um, and have that exposed. Maybe that's uh, for a political party, maybe that's not so bad, but there are other things that, um, that, that people might be involved in on the internet that uh, can be exposed by a data breach and have bad things uh, happen uh, because of that. Then there is a cyber extortion. Uh, there's something that's called ransomware, which has been um, uh, very prevalent in the last few years. What happens with ransomware is that the attacker software gets into a computer system and does something which um, denies access to the computer, denies access to the computer's data to the owner and says, you need to pay me so much money uh, before I will release this. Uh, and sometimes uh, these, these ransomware attacks um, can be very large and be very, very significant. In 2017, uh, there was a ransomware attack that made its way uh, into the system of a major shipping company, Maersk. Uh, and Maersk for a week was an, uh, unable, which is a worldwide shipping company, they were unable for a week to do um, their operations using computers. Uh, they suffered $300 million in losses, much of that having to do with lost business and also with replacing all of the computers that had been, uh, had been locked up. 
another type of cyber extortion is a threat to uh, release information to colleagues and, and contacts. Um, I debated whether to tell you this story, but I will anyway, because it's, it's, it's a little bit funny. Um, I have in the last month or so gotten a rash of emails uh, that are sent to an email address that I haven't used for quite a while. So when I first came to the university, um, uh, I had some uh, uh, username at UIUC, and we later became some other username at, at Illinois.edu. But, but this one is being sent to this old, old address, and it has in it a password that I used a long, long time ago. Now, this password has six characters, and, and if you do uh, you know, an enumeration of the number of passwords that have six characters, that alpha, alphanumerics, upper and lower case, and, and, and numbers, you come up with something like 65 billion. And I wasn't doing something stupid like naming, using my cat's um, uh, name as a, as a password. It was, it was fairly random. But what, <laughs> what these emails say, and, and what was funny is there was a batch of them, some of them in German, that says, um, we have installed um, a monitoring software on your computer, and we have been watching you at these very naughty porn sites. And if you don't pay us this Bitcoin, then we're going to send these clips that we have recorded to all of your associates. Well, that's ridiculous on a number of fronts. But um, one question is, how did they break? How did they get to uh, that password? And that's the more interesting portion of it. But mostly important here is that it's a, it's a type of cyber extortion that, that's actually happening. So um, that's not enough. So <laughs> we, we can pick up more threats later. But uh, th those, are the, those are the threats that are happening right now. So, so you have painted a very scary picture uh, of the world, and and this is, uh, of course, I'm sure why so many people have, have connected into this webinar. But you know, here we wanted to to, to talk a little bit more about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted cybersecurity, and so I wonder if you might sort of retouch on some of those things you just introduced and think, how does COVID-19, this pandemic we're all suffering through, change the game in cybersecurity? Are some of these threats more relevant? Are there new ways that people are using old threats? Uh, I think it, we'd all be happy to hear your, your views on that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the executive summary is that the threats themselves haven't changed so much, um, but the susceptibility to the threats has. Um, and so what do I mean by that? The, the pandemic um, has changed the behavior of people, citizens, business, and governments, and uh, cyber uh, criminals are taking advantage of that. Uh, people are home. Uh, they're doing more purchasing online. They're using uh, the internet uh, to find news about the pandemic. Uh, they're using the internet to communicate with others. They're filing for unemployment benefits. Businesses interacting with government agencies for loans. Uh, some businesses are, are limited, we're, we're limited to online uh, activity. Um, uh, sometimes what has to happen is that employees now need to work from home doing things that formerly they were doing in their business. And when they were at their business, they were protected by the IT infrastructure in the business, whereas at home they are not. And one of the real risks there is if they're using personal computers at home, which are exposed to the big bad internet, might be infected by something from the big bad internet, and then connect to, uh, to the business, not unlike what happened to Target, by the way, um, then, then badness that's been picked up um, from the personal computer might make its way uh, into, into the business itself. Um, so uh, I think that what is different is that, and one thing that, that happened early on with the COVID-19 is that there was a lot of money that was, that was changing hands. Um, uh, the, the government was, was handing out uh, $1,200 checks, um, then there were loans, uh, there were new rules that were created to be followed, all of which is to say that the, the contacts that people um, had in engaging with computers uh, changed. Uh, and what that means is that anything new might be normal. It's, it's before you had this change, then there was a, a certain pattern. 
and, and you might, if there's a certain pattern, detect when there was something that was different. But now when everything is different, then it's easier for, for the attacks to, to sort of hide uh, into, the, into the mix of, of new things that's happening. It's easier, I think, to, to dupe people into doing things that install malware on their computers or tablets or, or their phones. So, so that raises the, the question, we're using Zoom for this webinar, people are using Zoom uh, frequently uh, or tools like it. Um, you know, how, how secure, and this is a question actually coming from the audience, how, sec how can we secure ourselves from cyber attacks while using Zoom or other technologies? And, and basically, is Zoom safe? So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll preface that by saying there's not a single piece of software that's on your computer that has more than uh, 100 lines of code in it that's safe. Um, Zoom, like other teleconferencing uh, systems, um, are complex. Where there's complexity, there's opportunity. Um, and um, the, the particular risk for Zoom happened uh, for, for two reasons early on. One is that something that was used casually by a few people suddenly became used by many, 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 many people. Um, and they were just, they would use uh, default settings for this without really understanding uh, what the impact of having those default settings. So one of the things that you read about were these, these uh, what they call Zoom bombings, where somebody was having a meeting and some people would crash the meeting and, and, and grab the screen and, and dump a bunch of inappropriate stuff. Um, the reason that was happening was not because of a security flaw per se in Zoom, but because the uh, configuration that users have when Zoom got brought up allowed that and they didn't know. And so there are vehicles or mechanisms that one can use to protect against that. And, and we are protected in, in this, you know, <laughs> I know that I'm inviting somebody to crash this party uh, by, by actually saying that, but uh, you have these passwords and, and I, I saw that the, the thing that I clicked on to get onto this meeting uh, was more complex than, than most of them. So there are things that one can do to protect against that kind of thing. Uh, there are other concerns, um, one having to do uh, with encryption. And so for quite a while, um, Zoom was interact, uh, inaccurately saying that um, if you used Zoom, then as you uh, interacted on the client side and it went across the internet to, to another site, then that was, that was all encrypted. And so anybody that was able to tap that wouldn't know what's going on. Um, that was false. Um, and so they shouldn't have been saying that. Uh, it turns out that, um, there is a, a real serious limitation in video conferencing when you use encryption for anybody because it has to do with limitations then on, on uh, what, the, what the platform is able to do. And so a number of the features that people come to love and expect with, with these platforms simply are not available uh, by, by doing encryption. So it's one of these things, and we'll see this again and again, or we do see this again and again, there's a trade-off between usability and, and security uh, in, in these systems. So um, uh, you should be aware, you should not assume that your, your broadcast through Zoom um, is, is being encrypted. Uh, now, I think now if they say it is, then, then it is, but there are certain limitations on what you're able to do. Um, so that's, that's one aspect. Um, another aspect that is of some significant concern to the United States government um, is that the founder of Zoom, at least one of them, um, is from China and that there was reported to be information from Zoom sessions that were being sent home to China, which is like a fundamentally bad thing if you're a government agency. And so uh, a number of government people that I interact with um, are prohibited from, from using Zoom even, even because of that. Although I am told that that particular um, aspect of Zoom has, 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 has been removed. I think that the, the most serious threat that Zoom uh, presents is that it is uh, the newest piece of software in this space and has had, although now with the, with the virus, lots of opportunity to, to have uh, lots of use and things understood about it, but um, you have security flaws because you have complex software. 
and any of these things um, are really complex and this is relatively new and so I think it uh, needs more exposure time uh, to, to be um, as hardened as something that has been around uh, longer. So um, that's my take on Zoom. If I'm doing something uh, really sensitive, then I don't use video conferencing. There are these things that are called uh, telephones. Some of you might have seen them. Um, that's helpful. You get out of the internet altogether and, and use the, the carriers, which is not uh, an entirely safe in itself, but um, it's, it's a different vehicle for, for communication and you don't have to have pictures. No, that, that's an excellent point, David. Uh, you know, sometimes relying on older technology or, or technology that, that we were using more regularly before the COVID pandemic is, is very useful and, and for many reasons. Um, and, and I wanted to follow that up with a question. Um, you know, as, as we look with the pandemic, there's been a, a big change in the number of, and ways that people are working from home or working remotely. Uh, and so I wonder if there's any specific issues around cybersecurity that businesses and people that are working from home need to be aware of in terms of how they might want to deploy new software or new security features in their own infrastructure. So some of the um, challenges, specific issues that arise, I think, because for business when people work from home um, are as follows. Um, so there are these things that are called virtual private networks. And a virtual private network is something that is set up uh, that if I'm at home and I set up a VPN, and I'm sure lots of people on this call do this, uh, then that's in setting up uh, an encrypted channel between myself and the connection. Now, for, for me to do many things at the University of Illinois, um, I need to connect into the, into the VPN server there. So uh, one thing that happened as people were sent home to work is that um, they, they needed now to uh, be using VPNs uh, with uh, uh, infrastructure uh, to support that where the, the use of the VPN uh, would be much more extensive than, than it had been before. And so those that work at the University of Illinois and use a VPN, uh, if you go into sites that vpn.illinois.edu, you know that when you log in, it tells you in 48 point font, um, basically you don't need a VPN for a lot of things. And if you don't need it for, you don't need it for classes, you don't, they say, get off the VPN, would you? Um, if you don't need it. And the reason is that um, sustaining or supporting a VPN connection takes uh, computing resources. And, and slows things down. And so just not being able to support the, the load of VPN uh, was, was one issue that, that came around. Of course, you know, with time, then that can be, that can be built up. And, and, and I don't think right now that there are uh, so very many issues with, with, with VPNs. Um, one of the, the specific challenges I, I alluded to before, I think, and, and that's when people who are at home are using their, their home computer for work purposes, uh, which is very uh, convenient for the business because <laughs> they don't have to have to support it. Uh, but it, it does mean that uh, the home computer doesn't uh, enjoy the same levels of protection um, that a computer that's in the office office may. So I know that when I'm in the office at the University of Illinois, then there, there is a, a great deal of security infrastructure that's protecting me uh, from um, uh, things that are outside of the University of Illinois come in and, and getting at it. And if you're outside of that, then you don't have those protections and the possibility exists then that uh, using your personal computer uh, can be infected by something and then might possibly pass that um, along uh, to, to uh, to the company. Um, I do a lot of work, as I mentioned, with people at, at National Labs, and they are um, very varying degrees of, of um, uh, protection goes on and their ability uh, to connect to the lab uh, with computers at all uh, that, that aren't uh, issued by the lab and controlled by the lab, and, and that's one, one direction that one has to go. But the, the main issue here is that you're using uh, an uncontrolled piece of equipment to connect with, with the business. Um, other issues from the business point of view uh, might be that um, um, 
you don't have uh, oversight on the use of, of time and computing resources. And so if, if you thought your lazy employees uh, were spending um, too much time on social media and inappropriate websites when they were at work, just think about what's happening when they were at home. Um, it would be uh, an example. Uh, another one, and this, this was interesting, I, I, I found this as I was researching uh, the, the possibility that you would ask a question related to this. And, and that is that a business's cyber insurance policy might not cover uh, devices, network attached devices that are owned by employees. And so if a ransomware attack happened that uh, locked up employee data employer data on an employee machine, that might not be covered. And so there's some, some business risk uh, that way as well. That, that was really interesting um, and, and highlights the changes that, that come about, uh, the unforeseen changes that come about with something like this. Uh, you know, an, another example of a change like this is uh, seeing your doctor. Uh, I mean, at least here in the US, you know, we typically go in, we see our doctor, uh, but with the, the pandemic, there was a increased need for social distancing um, and eventually health insurance providers and doctors started supporting uh, telemedicine and virtual doctor visits. So one of the questions from the audience is, uh, you know, how can we with COVID-19 and telemedicine, how can we maintain HIPAA, the privacy, uh, uh, medical privacy, uh, and then just general connection security, this, the sort, same sort of things that we were just talking about when medical offices are using different platforms, uh, either commercial telemedicine platforms, uh, just Zoom or something else that, that may have all different types of security issues. I mean, do you have any insight into uh, you know, what, what may happen in the future with telemedicine and virtual doctor visits? Is there gonna have to be some new efforts or, or what? Um, so the, the fast answer is that I don't have any particular insight into what anybody should be doing to deal with the potential for for HIPAA violations uh, due to the fact that we're being pushed out, out to the edge. I think that's a, a really uh, good question and something that, that needs to be understood by businesses. So I'm, I'm glad that, that that was raised and um, taking a note or somebody's taking a note and I wanna, I wanna chase that down. Um, I do think that you know, in, in the broad that this whole COVID thing um, has changed the way we do things pretty significantly. Uh, telemedicine was coming along anyway, and I think that this just accelerated it. And so it accelerates the pushing of these kinds of problems to the forefront because you don't want to be messing with no HIPAA violations. That's bad news. And so somebody is going to have to figure out how all of this fits together and, and provide solutions uh, so that uh, people can go forward with the confidence that they're not breaking the law. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, in, in terms of the business perspective, there's obviously an opportunity here. So surely there's going to be a lot of entrants coming in trying to help uh, provide their own solutions. Um, you know, in, in light of all of this conversation, and this is another question from the audience, uh, you know, there's, there's and, and you mentioned this uh, at the very end of the, of the previous question where you talked about the uh, idea of, of cyber risk insurance and if people have their own computers and they're connecting in um, there may be issues there so i guess the, the the way of stating this question is um are there certain things that that people should look for in either hardware or software to ensure that it's going to be more secure if you're working from home i'm sure the answer to that is 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 yes and, and the reason that i'm reason that i'm pausing is that there's a there's a direction that that will emerge. I don't think it's happening now. It needs to happen now. It needs to happen as, as soon as possible. Um, but you know, getting back to the risk that uh, you've got something that's on your home computer and it's interacting with the business office and bad things can happen. Um, you you need to protect somehow that connection, uh, and there are there are different ways of doing that. Uh, one of those ways is to let the employee have whatever the employee's got and then just look really closely at the, uh, at the connections that are, that are coming in and, and apply very serious rules that, that try to limit what's, what's going on. So that, that makes pretty good sense, except that attackers are, are pretty 
uh, skilled at, at hiding uh, amidst normal looking activity. And so maybe something more than that um, is, is actually needed. Um, another approach is, I mentioned this is what some of the national labs end up having their people do or people, other people in government defense, um, is that they can only use um, uh, government issued computers that are locked down. You can imagine companies doing that um, as well, although that's, that's expensive. But to the point I, that, that you might have been making or the point that I thought of when you asked your question, uh, what, what's coming, I think, um, the things that you find on, or you can find now on, on lots of home computers are things that are uh, sometimes called trusted execution environments. And what that is, is a piece of hardware on your computer that cannot be tampered with by software that's, that's on the computer. We, when we want to sound like we're smart, we say that this is a root of trust, that if your computer is compromised, then the compromised computer still cannot cannot get through and into that, that trusted computing environment. Well, it, it turns out that people that build these things, uh, other people find out that they can, but, but it makes, makes it a lot harder. But the point being that when, when you have that kind of capability uh, on a computer, you have the potential for building applications that run on the home computer that, um, are trusted or trustable by the business computer and can be arranged that every interaction that happens between the home computer and the business computer rests upon this trusted execution environment and, and you have uh, greater trust, you have uh, greater confidence that the application that you're running, the traffic that you're generating uh, isn't malicious, isn't bad. And so that's the kind of thing that I think in a year or two, um, we will be looking for, for sure, um, as more and more of us are working from home uh, more and more to uh, establish that connection. But you can't run down to Best Buy right now and buy it, not yet. It's, it's coming, but it's not there yet. So, so this last few questions talked a lot about uh, being safer when you're working at home. Uh, but what about the general question of, of, you know, you're just going about your daily life, either with your phone, your cell phone, uh, with your computer, a tablet, something like that. Are there, are there ways that, that people can better protect themselves, their families, their coworkers, uh, just the people in their household? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think the best thing that you can do is, is get awareness. And what you get is awareness of the, the vehicles that attackers use um, to get into your devices and, and cause, cause, bad things to, cause bad things to happen. Um, so you need to be aware that um, this activity, it's, it's called phishing. Um, if you haven't seen it spelled, it's, it's great because uh, it's not like you're going out into the lake with a rod and, and, and trying to get these invertebrates. It, it's uh, fishing with a pH. And, and what it means is that uh, an attacker um, through means most often through email, but, but sometimes over the phone, um, is, is trying to convince the recipient that the source of the message um, is legitimate and that the recipient should do something. Now the do something uh, is usually, you know, click on a link or look at an image or uh, some of them used to, I, I think they've, they've found out it doesn't work so well, you know, download, download a new um, uh, video and clear. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> just, just as an aside, if, if you're, you know, on your computer and you're running and, and something pops up that says that um, your Adobe Reader is out of date, you need to update it, don't do it. That's, that's a very, very, very common attack. It looks, it looks good. The only way to uh, uh, update uh, Adobe Reader is go to the Adobe site and get it because um, it's an easy way of downloading software. Anyway, so the, the point is that these, these attackers are trying to trick people into trusting the message and then do something that allows uh, malware to, to get onto the device. And so opening an attachment uh, can do that. Um, if, if the attachment, it might be a legitimate word or 
or Excel file, or for that matter, a PDF file. The thing is that these files can have things that are called macros. Macros are little programs. And, and the programs can be malicious. So someone can send you um, a Word document that looks perfectly fine, even when you open it, but it executes this macro, and the macro causes, uh, goes through a sequence of things that causes bad things to happen. So awareness of people trying to, trying to fish um, is, um, is uh, part of the awareness thing. You need to be suspicious of any website that tries to get personal information beyond what's immediately needed for the transaction. So if the website is asking you for your date of birth or your social media accounts or your home address, if you know, there, there are no deliveries involved, any other kinds of uh, information of, of a personal nature, if there's no particular reason for it, then there's a pretty good chance that you're interacting with a website that's pretending to be a legitimate one, one that you recognize and you think is a legitimate one, but is not. So there's a kind of attack that's, that's uh, quite active right now and that's called redirection. Uh, a user is directed to a website. You look at the URL and it looks like an honest uh, URL, and, and, but you go there and it presents itself in the same way as the website as you thought you were going to, uh, but it's not. It's, it's run, by, run by the attackers. Uh, you should be aware that uh, browsers that you use, if they're not up to date with security patches, then that allows malware to uh, exploit the vulnerabilities in your browsers without you actively doing anything. So, you know, for a long time, you know, we, we, we shouted at people, don't click on it, don't click on links, and say, okay, okay, I'm not gonna click on it. And they end up visiting a site like the New York Times and end up getting infected anyway and say, my word, how did that happen? Well, there's a couple of ways. One is um, a site like, I don't want to pick on New York, New York Times or, or Amazon or any of these sites you go to that have advertising on the side. What's happening in those sites is that the, the advertising that's happening, that space is being uh, rented out. In fact, there's, there's, it's interesting, there's an online auction that, that goes on. Information about you, who's on the website, um, is provided to computers who have an auction, and the winner um, gets to put, insert, uh, an ad of some kind uh, in that space. Uh, this leads to an activity that is marvelously named malvertising, because uh, bad actors will pay money to participate in those auctions and the advertisements that they push into those, into those spaces um, have code in them that your browser will, it, it'll display, you know, whatever it is that the website is, is, is showing for, for buying boots or whatever it is. And then there's the advertising and what is loaded onto your computer includes that malware that got inserted into the advertisement. So that's malvertising. So the point being that um, you, can, you can be infected uh, even if <laughs> you don't click on anything. And so the way to protect yourself against that um, is to make sure that your browsers are um, up to date as with security patches as, as, as best you can. Um, another thing that you can do and should do is uh, applications and operating systems um, often will say, should I be uh, updated automatically when an update is, is presented? And you'll hear arguments both for and against the practice of allowing these automatic updates. Against is that sometimes uh, the updates cause new problems to occur that didn't exist before. Uh, but the, the other side is that uh, attackers are really very, very uh, up to speed on vulnerabilities. Uh, in, in all your applications, and as soon as patches are released to plug those vulnerabilities, then you really, you really need to do that. Uh, password hygiene is, is something else uh, that's, that's really important. Uh, I mentioned this, this old password that I use, six characters. Now, you would have thought, you would have thought that six characters with uh, 56, 57 billion possibilities 
uh, would be enough to keep somebody from being able to crack it. Um, but it evidently was not, or some website that I used it on uh, stored it in the clear, which is seriously bad practice. I don't think that that happened. Probably more likely that it was that it was cracked. So how, what do you do about uh, passwords? Well, you use passwords that are hard to guess by a human that knows you. And so, you know, the examples of using your cat's name or families or, or hobbies or your favorite sports teams, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't use passwords uh, that, that uh, can be looked up uh, in a dictionary. Use passwords that are hard to crack by brute force uh, computation. So uh, use lots of characters lots and lots of characters. Um, now, I went through the exercise once of going through um, all of the passwords that I use on all of the websites I visit um, to, to, to make every one of them unique. And this is important. And by the way, I should say that the way you manage this is to use something that's called password manager. And so um, you, you put in the password manager. Here is when I'm going to Amazon. This is my password when I'm going to UIUC. This is my password when I'm going to this. Is my, so to have different, different passwords, that's important. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's sort of an aside, but I'll tell you why. Um, and, and that is that if an attacker breaches one site and they discover your email address and they discover and there's a password and what they will typically see is some kind of encoded version of, of the password. But in any case, so, so they're able to do some work and associate the password with that email address. Then when they breach another site and find that same email address, they say, oh, let me try this password. And, and it can, and can let somebody in. So, you know, using passwords in multiple places um, is, is a no-no. So the way to manage that is to use one of these password manager programs uh, to do that. Uh, another point is to uh, use two-factor authentication uh, when you can. This was, for all of us servants of the state at the University of Illinois, this was mandated recently. And what that means is you log in, and then there's another check that has to happen. Uh, sometimes that check means you have a little device that you have plugged into your computer and you click on a thing and you're, you're, you're proving to the system that you have that device and that's the second check. You know the password, you have the thing. And so it lets you in. What I use is, is whenever I interact with the University of Illinois, um, I have it send me a message to a particular program that's called Duo and it'll say, you know, do you want to make this connection? And it'll, it'll just pop up on my phone. I'll say yes. And, and it goes through, it goes through. So two factor authentication can, can nip a lot of these things uh, in, in the bud and is, is getting easier to use. When it first emerged, it was not easy to use, but now it's easier to use. And so that's, that's something to embrace. And then finally, you know, don't share passwords uh, with, with people because uh, that, that gets around. Please, David, can you share a password? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll share my wife's password. And <laughs> so, so, you know, you've, you've uh, walked us through many different threat vectors uh, and, and lots of different ways to think about this. Uh, we have a question in the audience uh, that sort of relates to this. Um, you know, what, what's the success ratio of governments and, and agencies catching, tracking and catching cyber criminals? I mean, is it, is it even worth it for an individual or a small business to report, uh, a, you know, a significant personal hack, whether that's personal, financial, or health related? So I will say yes, but for a different reason. So um, you report the hack, uh, the chance of it resulting in a prosecution of somebody, um, I don't have the data on this, but my guess is that it's, that it's pretty low. Uh, however, the, you, you contribute to the community knowledge about what the attackers are doing and enable um, others, enable protections to be mounted against the particulars of, of that, particular, that particular attack. And so it's, it's community service to report it uh, so that people can, can understand what's going on and, and try to defend it. Uh, but I don't think it, it typically, now there are some notable, notable exceptions and you read about these uh, where they, they arrest someone um, uh, in Europe in, uh, or, or um, 
not arrest them. They, they convict them of, of doing certain bad things. But there really aren't very many of those in the news. Um, it's also true that, you know, with regard to all this, this uh, fishing stuff that goes on, you know, there, there aren't as many seriously bad actors uh, in the commercial space anyway um, as, as you might think. There's a lot of activity, but that's because the bad actors that exist there um, are really good at using automation. Uh, so on the other hand, you know, if you can get one of them, then, you know, you've made a dent in it. Um, uh, but a lot of what's going on out there is, is automated. Uh, and some of it is not very sophisticated. So there's, you know, the, the, the really bad guys, there aren't very many really bad guys, except for the state-sponsored ones. Um, but but uh, the, there are, <laughs> not to pick on anybody from New Jersey, but, you know, there are pimply-faced uh, teenagers in basements of New Jersey that are running scripts that cause, you know, bad things to happen and try to do fishing and so on. And there's quite a, quite a robust um, economy of stealing information credit card information, for example, and selling it on something that's called the dark web. And, and you would be surprised at how little your credit card number, along with your secret code, um, will sell. You know, somebody might buy that for 50 cents because there, there's, there's so much of it that's for sale. It's blind man. <clears throat> that's, that's very interesting. Um, you know, going back to this, this general topic, um, you were talking about the phishing and uh, the script kitties and, and all of this. Uh, you know, if people are afraid that they've, they've already been hit and, and, and you made the case about Nextel, you know, it, was ten, it was multiple years that, that they were um, uh, infected and being spied on. Is there some way, and, and again, this question comes from the audience, is there some way to determine if malware has already infected a device or is already part of the system? Oh yeah, sure. Um, and there's some really good uh, and free products um, that, that will do that. Um, the, the not free versions of them are ones that um, are running all the time and as your computer interacts with things um, are, are looking for, for these bad actors. Uh, so that, that catches um, a lot of stuff. It, it's interesting, the, one of the things that people are very concerned about in the cybersecurity community are things that are called zero day vulnerabilities. And those are, those are vulnerabilities um, that haven't been discovered before. And so someone that knows about this vulnerability and has been able to craft an attack that uses it, it's a secret. Nobody knows about it. Well, that's very threatening. However, most of the attacks that happen um, happen against vulnerabilities that have been known for quite a while and for which patches have been known for quite a while. And what that means is that things like having software that's able to go and detect the presence of these things uh, is, is a good investment. Um, it's there, it won't catch everything, to be sure. It won't catch everything, uh, but it will catch a lot of the cruft that's out there. And, and you really should be using that, even if you're using a Macintosh, you should be doing that. Okay, good, good advice. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, and, and I think that one of the outcomes of this, this webinar is likely that we probably should be producing some uh, educational curricula around this topic. Uh, but I wanted to, to leave with one other question from the audience here, and that is, uh, who would you or what would you consider to be a reliable source to learn the latest on cybersecurity? And, and the caveat here is uh, not, not a source trying to sell you a product. Do you have some advice for the audience? So uh, I, I think I missed I, I missed a word. So who's a reliable source in, to get information? Uh, yeah, either a reliable source, you know, either a person or a, a place, an institution, or a company that they can give some good advice on cybersecurity for those that, that want to dig deeper after this webinar. Well, so if you're um, a commercial firm and you have the uh, wherewithal to, to hire consultants. Um, hire a consultant from one of the larger firms. Um, they will have they will have the people uh, that know the things that that need to be known. Um, if you don't have those those kinds of resources, um, actually the we we, we can uh, be happy that in some ways some of our taxpayer money is well spent um, in that the Department of Homeland Security um, has quite an active uh, presence on the internet providing information 
um, about cybersecurity and about where there are courses, some of them free, uh, where you can uh, take, uh, learn about, about these things. And so uh, those would be the, 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 the two things that I would think of immediately. All right, great. Thank you, David. Um, I don't know, we might have time for one more question, uh, if it's quick. Um, I guess if, if I was to dive in um, and, and thinking there may be some people on the, on the audience that are a little more into the, uh, the general nature of IT, business IT, um, what are some other issues that might keep uh, IT people up at night? Uh, you mentioned a lot, obviously, but are there a few that you could quickly mention? Sure. Well, I, I know issues that keep um, OT people up. Uh, this is inside baseball, I suppose. But, you know, a lot of the work that I do um, has to do with cybersecurity in industrial control systems. And they're using computers and communications, whether it's called operational technology, it uses special devices. And what is a great concern right now in that space um, is, is something that's called uh, issues related to supply chain. And so you have a piece of software and uh, having an understanding and confidence that all of the pieces of that software um, are trustable um, is really a very large challenge. If you look at the way that that software is constructed, you might think it, it sort of reminds you of the ways that a sausage is constructed. You don't want to see it. Um, it's, it's complicated and there are lots of moving parts and a lot of opportunity for, for bad things to slip in. So um, I, the same concern uh, exists uh, for um, IT as well. You have software, and even a greater diversity of software that runs on, on computer systems um, and, and um, knowing that the software that's there uh, can be trusted is um, really, really important. It, it goes back to this, this point, or let me tell you, uh, I haven't got time for a story, but uh, a case that I heard about was someone installed a particular piece of software uh, from a site that reported to be this open source uh, piece of software that played videos. Uh, it turned out not to be. It, I mean, it, it did play videos. It just had some um, extra surprises like a cracker box jar. So um, being concerned about that is, is something that's um, uh, really, really concerning. IT people need also to be concerned about vulnerabilities uh, due to social engineering. Uh, there's a number of vi fun videos to find uh, on the internet where, where you see how someone um, tricks uh, a help desk into uh, providing a password or resetting something on a phone or or something like that you have to you have to be concerned any place where you have contact with people or with electronics is a place where attackers might come in and so you you, you need to be need to be concerned about that um, there are things that ordinary people ought to be worried about not just it people um, and i'll just <laughs> i'll say this because you know we're, we're heading into in the voting season and, and with the pandemic, uh, there's a, a growing push to do online voting and states, particularly New Jersey and West Virginia and Delaware um, are heading this way, despite warnings from DHS and cybersecurity experts to avoid this because of the, the risks of, of doing uh, online voting. And, and something else to be worried about is that there's evidence of, of foreign governments that are working both to steal sensitive COVID-19 information uh, that's being used to try and, and develop um, uh, treatments and inoculations, uh, but also the possibility of, of corrupting uh, stored data to skew analysis. I had a conversation with an FBI agent about this just last week, uh, where there's a lot of concern uh, about this kind of thing going on. So, you know, I guess it turns us all into insomniacs if you really worry about it. There's a lot going on that you don't yeah going on. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. It's been really great, uh, very informative. Uh, that I think I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Thank you, David. We just really appreciate all of your great insights today and the, the great conversation here. Um, thank you also to all of our participants for attending this webinar and bringing your great questions to, to the conversation. As we wrap up, we do want to gather your interest um, your continued interest via a poll that will um, you'll see in the Zoom window. So please take a moment to participate. 
Also, we hope you gained, um, you know, we hope you gained valuable knowledge today. We also hope that you'll join us for our next webinar um, next uh, on Tuesday, June 23rd at 11 a.m. Central Time. Uh, Lynn McChristian will present coronavirus and insurance coverage. We look forward to seeing you then and wish you a great day.